Gordon, uh, who's our visitor today. Uh, Dawood has done a lot of really interesting work in ubiquitous computing, um, which we'll talk about today. And he's also uh, currently working on a really interesting privacy-related startup, which I think you're also going to tell us about. Awesome. So um, anyway, it's been, uh, it's been a real treat having him in the department today. Uh, he joined us uh, the goodness of, of his heart. He just happened to be in Buffalo. So and for cocktails. And for cocktails. Ever, OK, OK. We, did, we, 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 did, we did pay him in drinks and food, right? But you know, next time you guys are at home and just sort of hanging out, you might want to think, can I stop in somewhere and give a talk? So, uh, But we really appreciate you being here. And we're looking forward to your talk. Let's uh, welcome Doug. Well, uh, thanks, Jeff, for, uh, for the introduction. It's, uh, it's actually been a really interesting day. I've talked to a lot of people in different areas. And everyone I've spoken to so far seemed to have overlap with the research that I've done and part of which I'm going to be presenting. So um, we, can also, we can also do this very interactively. So if you have any questions, you can stop me at any point and I'll answer them. Um, the talk is broken up into three different segments, so we can also have a little period in between the segments to, to discuss what we've just gone over. And um, so I, I kind of redid the title a little bit, and it's called Group Activity Recognition for Personal Data Empowerment. So the first two sections of the talk are going to be about activity recognition, and at the end I'm going to say something about a startup and what, what does personal data empowerment mean, and, uh, and how am I trying to help people achieve this with a startup. But I threw a, a good deal of that out because this is a scientific colloquium, and I figured we should probably be focused on the research. Um, and uh, so all of the research, I'm a bad, bad person. I took all of those papers out of the libraries of the ACM and, and Springer and IEEE and, uh, and put them all on my own website. So if you, if you want to see any of the papers or the dissertation, which contains uh, most of the published material as well, you can download all of it from, uh, from, from my website. There's, um, you can also buy my uh, dissertation on Amazon if you want, but you can download it for free, so I don't know why you would do that. And, um, <laughs> And exactly. So, uh, so the, the research, I, uh, my PhD was conducted at KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Uh, for part of it, I was a visiting researcher. I'll tell you that chapter when we get to it at the ETH, where that research was done. And, uh, and now I have a small startup with a partner and a couple of my ex-students, um, uh, which is called Two Cents, uh, not to worsen, <laughs> and, uh, and is, in, is in Brooklyn. All right, so that's me. Um, so this is, this is the talk I'm going to be uh, having today. I'm going to start off briefly with um, what is activity recognition and how it can help us in crowd emergencies. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And now I'm going to go into the second part, which is this is the work that was done at DTH, which is um, how can we detect groups of individuals, figure out who belongs together in a group who is connected through social interaction with each other for crowd emergencies, and how can we figure that out in peer-to-peer -peer methods. So during emergencies, how can we do that without requiring a back end? And, uh, and show you how we evaluated the methods using an experiment. Um, then I'm going to talk about once we've figured out uh, who, who belongs together in the group, um, how we can decipher or differentiate between different types of behavior of the group as an organism uh, based on observation of the individual members of that group. And also that's evaluated with, uh, with an experiment and, uh, and some, oh, I have a card for you. I have to get the other back. Okay. Um, and then, finally at the end, this is going to be a very short part, there's going to be a grim reality of how all of this technology is actually used, and how that's not a very good thing, and why we probably don't want it to be like that, and how um, even though we're doing all of this to make the world a better place for the users, that actually is being used to make the world a worse place for users, and how my startup Two Cents is trying to fix that. Okay, so the question we are asking is, how can we recognize human behavior? How can we understand the behavior of a human being based on the sensor signals coming from their mobile and wearable devices, so smartphones, um, uh, wearable watches, uh, there's even Android jewelry now. So how can we use all of this to gain insight for users into their own behavior? And the answer is wearable activity recognition. And so obviously, okay, that's a great term, but how do we do that? So the first thing you have to do is figure out the activities that you want to recognize. Right? So if you look at this, you see, okay, this is a guy who's walking along and using his phone, so we could call that walking, but somebody else might look at the same thing and say, okay, that's commuting, right? And then maybe in a different language in German, it's Bauten, which of course is written in all caps with an exclamation point, because German is about everything I say, or it's uh, coming out in Spanish. So, you know, what happens is for one type of activity, you may think, okay, it's walking, but walking has a thousand different names. So the namespace for one specific kind of activity is infinite. Right, so that's the first problem, right? Everybody refers to it as something else. Now, 
Here's the second problem. Now, there's many different ways in which an individual can walk, right? Like, if you're English, you probably end up walking like this. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we start off with this problem? Well, we have to select one label. So we say, okay, we're going to recognize something that's called walking or dolphin or commuting. And we're going to call it walking, right? So we pick one of these. And then we have to pick a subset of the behavior that we want to recognize. So we say, we're going to define this label walking as anything within this realm. So you draw sort of a border around all of the space of physical activity of a human being and say everything inside this border is walking. And that is called an activity class, right? And this is what we're going to recognize. So we're not going to recognize this kind of walking or this kind of walking, but we're going to recognize all of these within a class of, of human behavior, which we're going to call walking. And then once we've done that, the next step is to pick the sensors and the features that we want to use in order to recognize this, right? So what, what sensor do I need to use if I want to recognize somebody walking? Well, here's one example where you have all of these different types of behavior. You're running, uh, 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 strength training, scrubbing something, and what they picked was accelerometers, right? Because they decided, the bad news is that this is all experience-based. They decided that picking an accelerometer was a great way to figure out what somebody was doing. Actually, the question went the other way. They were trying to figure out what can we recognize with an accelerometer. And a lot of times, if you're trying to recognize some new and novel kind of activity, you're going to have to go out yourself and try a bunch of different sensors and see which one of them performs the best. So once we've selected a sensor that we want to use in order to uh, measure some aspect of the activity, right? so we need a sensor that picks up some aspect of walking that is also going to help us to decide between, that differentiate between walking and maybe running, we're going to have to make sure that whatever difference there is between these two behaviors has an effect, a physical effect in the sensor, which that sensor then gives us the digital data. Then we have to figure out what are the aspects of that data stream that we need in order to turn that into behavior information. And so for this example, they use uh, mean and the energy of the signal, which is a function of the integral, and then uh, frequency of humane, entropy, and correlation features. So how do these, how does the, how does the, sensor, the sensor data coming from one sensor correlate to the sensor coming from another? another sensor, and those are the features they use. And if at any point of these, if you pick a sensor that doesn't measure the parts of the activity that you want to recognize, you're going to get uh, garbage in, garbage out. You're going to get bad results. If you have a great sensor and you pick the wrong features, you're going to get bad results. There's algorithms that will help you pick the features. Um, if you have a whole bunch of features, they'll help you figure out which one of them is useful and which one of them is not useful. But pretty much, this is also experience-based. What features do I throw in there to figure out what's going to come out? So that's one example, right, where we have all these different activities and we want to differentiate them from each other. And here's a very different example where what we're now trying to recognize, instead of differentiating all of these from each other, we're now trying to recognize swallowing here versus everything else. So everything else doesn't matter to us. We just want to pinpoint in time, it's called activity spotting, pinpoint in time every time somebody swallows. And here the sensor they used is this uh, compassive net band. And I actually saw uh, the woman uh, that published this uh, uh, she, her presentation was really funny because in the middle of the presentation, she, she throws up a live data feed and starts drinking water, and you can really clearly see when she's swallowing, you see it. Your eyes are the classifier that's recognizing that behavior from the sensor signal. And so here you see different features, right? So it's a completely different sensor, different behavior, different sensor, different features that sees you. So it's really, it's unfortunately, it's experience-based, and uh, you have to have some understanding about the physical nature of the activity and of the sensors. And so now we get to the point where we want to classify what's going on. So what is classification? How do we use machine learning to figure out what the behavior is of the individual? Well, we have these features. So let's take this example here where it's just um, mean of the x-axis and mean of the y-axis. This is not real data, so um, these are probably going to be off. But we have uh, two activities. Uh, walking is labeled in blue where you, know, you have a, a lower value for, for the mean of the y-axis and a higher value for the mean of the x-axis. And running is then in red where we have um, the other, the other way around, and what we want to do is we want to have uh, we want some kind of algorithm that's going to cut these in half for us and say, well, everything on this side of this line is one activity, on the other side of the line is another activity. And again, you can see this would be a pretty poor uh, estimator because you have a couple dots in the red that are down here in the blue section. So these were actually running, but would be classified as walking, and these are actually walking and be classified as running. And what machine learning does, in essence, is look for the best way to discriminate between these two different classes. So whatever machine learning algorithm we're going to get, what it does is it puts that line, it's not always linear, and it's not always a line, and there's, always, there's many different ways, there's 
uh, support vector machines or Bayesian inference. There's many different algorithms you can use, but more or less what they're all going to do is cut somewhere, cut the data in such a way that we can say, this point is going to be from walking and this point is going to be from running. So that's what, that's what we're trying to build. Now the question is, well, how does it help us? So we have this guy who's using his mobile device, and the argument at the beginning of every scientific paper in activity recognition is, um, our phones are mean to us. We need activity recognition so that our phones can understand our behavior, and then they'll be nice to us by not interrupting us, right? So this is, this is the, the big vision of research, why we're doing all of this. So what we have is coming out of this device, we have sensor observations of the physical behavior of this human being, or it could even be um, non-physical behavior. We have some sort of sensor that, that, uh, that monitors some part of the behavior of this human being. We put that into that chain that I just showed you in the past couple of slides. We put that in some sort of decision engine, which turns that into actionable information. And what we get is, from this decision engine, we get proactive behavior on the part of the mobile device or from an intelligent environment, which is now able to do what you want it to do before you even tell it that that's what you want. It just knows, okay, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's holding a presentation here, so we thin the lights and turn on the presenter before I even have to push the buttons. Right? That's, that's, that's the vision. This is how it's supposed to help us. And now the question is, well, you know, how can this help us in a crowd emergency, right? So if we have a crowd emergency, what, what can this give us that would benefit us there? And the answer is, uh, this is a, a, a snapshot of an article on the BBC um, of the disaster that occurred at the Love Parade, where 19 people were killed when uh, a badly designed entrance to a festival in Germany uh, was stampeded by too many people who were pushing to get through. And, uh, and, you know, and this, was, this was unintentional behavior. Nobody wanted this to happen, but it still had catastrophic consequences for the environment and for the individuals in the crowd. And uh, Dirk Helbing and Pratik Mukherjee uh, did an analysis, you know, came out about, I think, nine months after the event, of what went wrong and what we could have done to correct it. And they are, they are uh, social scientists and physicists who model the behavior of human beings using the same uh, tools that they would use to model the processes of uh, you know atoms in the Large Hadron Collider. So it was a very it's a very interesting point of view to be coming at, at emergency situations from. And what they said is what we need to do is we need to recognize the behavior of the crowd in real time so that we can manage that behavior in order to pre prevent these types of emergencies. Right? And so we're looking now at activity recognition in this recognized stage where we want to recognize what's going on in real time so that we can give a management system information about what's going on in real time in order for that management system to make that decision engine to make some kind of decision about what needs to be done in order to prevent this from happening before it happens. Now, um, the, first, the first thing that anyone who's been to a, to a massive crowd event like a concert, this is a picture from a concert that occurs annually in Karlsruhe in Germany, and this is normally it's just a grassy hill. And at this concert, the stage is out in front, and this entire hill is just covered in individuals, as you can see, and they call it Meat Mountain, <laughs> for obvious reasons. And, uh, and so the first thing that happens is, when you have an event like this, as soon as you enter this event, all of these individuals are, are, are using two or three different cell towers. And then when you've been to an event like this, the first thing you notice is that you lose data connectivity. So your phone doesn't connect to the internet, right? That's the first thing that happens. And then uh, once it gets even more overloaded, text, if you send a text message to somebody, it will arrive once you leave the event, maybe sometimes even the next day. So we have no data in, no data out. So how are we supposed to, you know, uh, be aware of the behavior of the crowd through automatic machine learning approaches if we have no way of communicating with the crowd. And the answer is we need to work on algorithms that run peer-to-peer -peer within the crowd using the devices with, of the crowd members to one, observe individuals, to process that information into some kind of uh, understanding of what the behavior is of groups of individuals and the crowd, and then be able to use that to give any kind of management system which is also going to have to work peer-to-peer -peer, the information it needs to make decisions. So that's what we're working towards. Okay, so now I'm going to get into, into part one of the talk, and this is about how can we detect uh, using distributed observations of individuals by their own devices in order to uh, figure out which individuals uh, belong together and which individuals do not belong together. So who, who, when, when you show up to a concert, who are your friends, who are the people that you don't know, right? Because any management situ uh, system is going to have to be aware of that if it's going to tell people where to go, because groups display affiliative behaviors in emergencies, which means the most important thing is your social connections. People that you already know are those people that you're going to stick with. And so if two of you get different instructions, they're probably going to be ignored. So 
Okay, so how do we figure out who belongs together in a group and who is separate from each other? So here's, here's the, you know, the old expression, birds of a feather flock together. And this came from the observation that when you see a large flock of birds, that they're always the same species, right? So birds of a feather flock together, because people notice that you know, if you have, if you have uh, two different flocks of birds in the same space and you want to differentiate them from each other, just look at the feathers. Look at, look at the species of the bird, and you'll see that the two groups are separated by which species they're in, right? So the assumption is if we had a sensor that senses the plumage of the bird, then we could figure out which group it belongs to and figure out how many groups we have in an environment. Is it all one flock or do we have two different flocks? Um, and, um, and so what we want to do now is apply that same thing to human beings, except human behavior is far more complex than, than you know, the type of plumage that birds have. So one, it's constantly changing, right? From second to second, my behavior is changing. And, uh, and you know, the color of a bird's feathers don't change. And the other thing is, depending on the group, my behavior will also change. So different groups have different uh, social expectations of the members of the group, as I'll show you in a sec. And, uh, and users will actually change their behavior when they enter a group, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. But so one of the effects, one of the reasons why, um, why individuals will adapt their behavior to fit the group is called the chameleon effect. And the chameleon effect states that two people that are interacting with each other will mimic each other's physical behavior. So if, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm sitting somewhere and talking to you across the table and I cross my arms, Unconsciously, you might also cross your arms, right? That's one of those things that just happens. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's human nature, this chameleon effect. And so, you know, we have two people who are now ex, uh, exhibiting similar behavior because they're in a group. So they're not in a group because they have similar behavior, but they have similar behavior because they're in a group. Now, there's also groups that form when people join together because they have similar behavior. So people who like doing yoga do yoga together, right? So that's a that's a different example. But um. Then there's also uh, social norming, which, act, which occurs when a group is formed. And what happens is this group decides that there are certain roles. This is not, a, this is not an explicit process. It's an implicit process with emergent uh, properties. They just decide together, OK, so there's this type of role in the group. There's, you know, there's, these are the people that are leading the group. And they also uh, 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 create uh, behavioral expectations four different roles in the group. So somebody who's helping, who's a helper person in a group, if they're expected to help, for example. And it's been shown that um, if you have an existing group and somebody joins the group, they're gonna find their way into one of these roles, and the processes through which they do that are not exactly clear, but it's guaranteed that they're gonna find their way in there. And, um, and once they enter one of these roles, you can observe that their behavior changes to fit the behavioral expectations for that role. So again, we have, we have uh, behavioral similarities for members within a group. And the third thing is, uh, we form groups because they are efficient at achieving things, right? We are much, much better in a group than we are separate. So um, that's the reason, if you look at evolutionary theory, why animals can, can form a group. Because a herd of wolves can hunt better than each wolf individually can hunt, if you were to add that up. So it's, you know, there's a, they have a, uh, an advantage for being in a group. And being in a group, we're doing something, and that thing that we're doing, we're often doing it at the same time, which means the behavior for example, here, cheers, you know, everyone's behavior is the same for a second. That's something that we want to be able to detect in order to figure out that, uh, that these people are group together. And so um, what you see here is you see all these images where you see a group of people and you can tell, okay, these guys are all working together. So, you know, because they're all working together, they all have similar behavior. But we see the whole group, right? If we go back to the crowd analogy, if we're looking at this crowd, there's no single point in our system that can observe the entire group. So how can we do the same thing that we can do with an image without having that image, with only having observations of individuals that are made by their mobile devices? And uh, mobile devices are great because they have a really high user fidelity. Even if, you know, even if the cell network breaks down, each device still has a perfect view, but of only one individual. So how can we combine all those perfect views without any center, without any point, that can see the, the, the entire image. And the way you would do that um, until now, without uh, require, without when you're not using a peer-to-peer -peer system, is you would use a centralized server and a correlation analysis. So take all everybody's data and put it up on a server. And then the first thing you do is uh, you compute the cross-correlation between time series of individual sensor measurements. And, uh, and what that gives you is an n by n disparity matrix. So let's say we have 10 individuals here, one through 10, and these are those same individuals here. So this spot is, um, is you know, individual one to two, and, and, uh, and a, a very dark value is, uh, is a correlation of one, so they're uh, 
very uh, disparate. This is a disparity matrix. And a like dot is a correlation of zero, which means that they are very, uh, which is very similar. And uh, and so what happens is you have uh, you have you have these graphs that come out. So this is you know if, if everybody is walking by themselves, this is if everyone's walking together. Here we have two groups that are all that are walking separately, and here we have three groups that are walking separately. And you can kind of see, okay, I see here this light box that's similar uh, members, and I see here this light box, and that's similar members. And you can kind of see your eye kind of says, okay, there's two different boxes. Right? And here you can see three different boxes. So we see that the information is available to figure out if people are together or not, but we need to come to that method uh, programmatically. So what we do is a multi-dimensional scaling, which is pretty much you, uh, you assume that each one of these rows is a 10-dimensional vector, and, uh, and, uh, which, and, and each one of these dots is, a, is the distance between one person and another person, and you squish that down into two-dimensional space, which is going to make a lot of errors occur because you know there's a lot of you know, dimension number nine is not going to fit anymore, but you squish it down and you make it like each of these uh, bands elastic and it bounces around and so you minimize the errors and eventually you come to a graph like this. And uh, see so this is two dimensional representing uh, a ten dimensional uh, uh, set, ten, ten vectors in ten dimensional space. <coughs> and then you use uh, graph embedding which pretty much chops, chops, uh, chops these up. So you see here, each one of these has sort of a different symbol. Here they all have the same symbol here. Um, these are squares and these are circles, so we've seen that there's two groups here, and we figured out who belongs to who. And then here we have three different groups. So that's how you do it if you could see all of the data. So how do we, how do, we do this now if we can only see snapshots of the data? Well, the method uh, that, uh, that we introduced is uh, divergence-based affinity detection, uh, uh, DBAD for short. And what we want to do is we want to assess similarity between neighbors, not by comparing sensor signals together, but by comparing models of those signals together so that we only have to exchange model parameters instead of exchanging the entire signal itself. And so what we do is we create a model of a window over time of sensor data, exchange the parameters of that model with the neighbor, and then calculate the divergence using the Jeffries divergence between those models in order to get an indicator of how similar uh, the behaviors between these two individuals. And we call that, uh, that indicator an indicator of social proximity, which just says, uh, um, how, how similar are these two individuals to each other socially, given the social context in which uh, the group was formed that they are in, and also how well our sensor is at picking up the behavioral similarities in that group. And then uh, what we want to do is we want to filter that social proximity over time and figure out if we can come to a, a conclusion about uh, group affinity using a classification system. And so this is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the algorithms that we use. So uh, we're using uh, orientation sensors, which give you an indication of direction using a magnetic compass, and then accelerometer signals, which, uh, which give you uh, an indication of, of motion uh, parameters. And so we have uh, a fun Mises model for, for, um, for, orientation, uh, for the orientation sensor, where you can imagine it's a vector that goes around 360 degrees. And, uh, and we take a distribution over that circle. It's a circular distribution, this fun Mises distribution, which is, um, you know, it's a histogram over which direction the person was walking. And then for acceleration, we have a Gaussian mixture model, which just tells us um, what the probability density function is for that uh, um, observation window that we were looking at. And then we take that Jeffrey's divergence of, of uh, two models from neighboring nodes where more or less the way uh, you, um, so this is the Jeffrey's divergence and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an expansion of the kullback Leibler distance. And the reason we use it is because uh, in, in reality, a distribution will never be zero. There's always a positive value. But in computation, what happens is that positive value becomes smaller than your register can contain and you get zero. And the kullback Leibler distribution, this, this term is here as a divisor and then uh, when one of those equates to zero, then all of a sudden you have division by zero and your whole program crashes. So this one is numerically stable, which makes it a lot more fun to work with. A lot more fun. So, uh, so we use this, and it's, it's a fairly simple concept. So if you see here, it kind of might be hard to see, but we have two distributions that are overlapping. And more or less, uh, the in, it's, it's, it's a function that scales with how much surface area do these two have when you overlap them with each other that doesn't uh, coincide. So subtract this part here where they coincide with each other, and, and, and the surface area that's left will give you an indication of how similar the models are to each other. So if we have a lot that's left over, it means these models are completely separate. If we have a little less left over, it means that they're matching each other. And what we want to find out is if we can use that metric to tell us how similar people are based on their sensor signals. 
And, uh, and the next step what we do is, is we, look at, we look at each node and we say, okay, which neighbors are in its immediate vicinity? And, uh, and we create a, a matrix like the one I showed you in the last slide, but now it's not from everybody to everybody, but only from immediate peer-to-peer -peer one hop neighbors. So only the neighbors that I can see with local communication, those are the ones whose data I, I, uh, I, whose models I receive and who gets my model, and then we uh, construct that matrix for each other. And then the filter is just averaging values for one single individual over time. And we'll see how that affects the results. So this is the uh, experiment that we did to evaluate how well this algorithm performs. Uh, this experiment was done at the ETH, so I showed up and they were like, oh, we have this data set and nobody's used it, so why don't you go and do something with it? And for me, it was perfect, so I was really happy about that. And they were happy that somebody used a data set that they had created, because if I didn't, I don't think anybody else was going to. So it worked out well for everybody. And this uh, data set is also published as part of uh, the publication. So if any of you want to play with it, feel free to download it. Um, so what it is, is there's a circle here, and there's uh, 12 points set up around the circle. You can see there's like these little stands here. Each one of these has a number on top. And then we split the group up into, into different group configurations, and each subgroup had a leader who had a list of numbers that they had to walk out. So they walked out, they all went around, I'll show you a video in a second, walked out these numbers. There were 12 subjects in total, each one of them had an Android monitoring device with an uh, accelerometer and, and, and the compass being sampled, and we have about 51 minutes of data uh, per subject. So, this is, what, this is what the experiment looks like. Obviously, this has been sped up. These guys aren't just running around really fast with really, taking really small steps. And the first thing you can notice is when you look at this, that your eye is a great classifier, right? And the global view makes it very easy to figure out who is together in a group. So if I watch this video, after a couple seconds, you're pretty clear that there's two groups going on here, right? That's the global view. Global view means easy detection. If I can see everything, that I can figure out pretty easily who belongs to whom. But what this requires is it requires a timeline, right? It requires a timeline of observations. If I pause these guys. This, this video is missing very huge music. Yeah, I know, right? I know we get a lot of fun right into that slap stick, Charlie Chaplin dancing around. I'll do that in my next talk. That's, that's, a, great, that's a great recommendation. So the interesting thing is, let me see if I can get the order right. So the interesting thing is, right, it requires a timeline of observations. So if I, look at, if I look at one snapshot, maybe it's easy to tell what's going on in there, right? Sometimes it can be really easy. You see, okay, two groups. But if I look at a different snapshot, you, it's, it, it's hard to tell. You're not sure. Is there two groups there? Is there one group? Is everyone running around by themselves and just happen to be in one place? So um, how, can we, how can we figure this out in a peer to peer fashion where we don't have to exchange the entire timelines with each other, right? That's, that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. And so this is this is the first uh, this is the first little bit of the uh, of the evaluation. So what we can see here up at the top, first of all, the circles is using uh, orientation, right? So we'll start off with orientation. What you see is up at the top. Um, this is the window length. So how much data we're using at each iteration to figure out if people are together or separate. Um, this is the window length down here. So this is uh, this is uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. What 30 seconds means is every 30 seconds we take 30 seconds of data. Um, and this top line is the, is the correlation-based centralized approach. So every 30 seconds, we take 30 seconds of data from each user, correlate that with each other, get an indicator of how similar they are based on correlation, uh, then uh, cluster that uh, and, and, and come to a conclusion about who belongs to whom. And the longer I make that window, the better this gets, right? So we're going to get better and better and better until eventually we get up to about 90% over, over the entire experiment. Um, so that's centralized, right? So if I have a global view, I can detect fairly easily who belongs to whom, and the more data I have, the longer I observe these groups, the better my recognition gets. So now let's look at the, uh, uh, DBAD, the distributed method using uh, orientation. And what you can see here is uh, I'm, I'm worse off than with a centralized system, right? It appears like a negative result at the beginning. I have, uh, I have a slight peak here at five seconds, and then after that, I just kind of drop off in the noise. So the longer I observe it, the worse my observation gets for some reason. And, uh, and the third thing you see is down here, all of this, this X line, this is acceleration using whatever method I apply to it. Right? And, and this right here, this is the noise level. This means we have, there's no result. There's no indication of who belongs to whom if we're using the accelerometer. And, and what that is telling us is that we need to have a sensor that senses those part of the human, uh, that part of the human behavior which is similar for this type of group. And in this, and in this uh, setting, this experiment where everyone's walking around, everyone is walking. The accelerometer is great at detecting walking, right, if we're looking at recognition, if we want to recognize the behavior, but it's terrible for differentiating two different groups that are all both walking together. 
So if you're gonna, this is back to the right at the beginning when I was talking about when you want to recognize something, make sure that you have a sensor that senses those part of the uh, that part of the behavior, which is indicative of what you're trying to look for. And so what we're going to look at now is what is going on here in this five seconds. One, why do we have a bad? We want to figure out why do we have a bad value here. Why why does this look like a negative result? And there's two possible reasons why that could happen. One is the information you're looking for. These are not the droids you're looking for. You know that information is not in the signal the signal that we're mining for this for this information. That's the one possibility. The other possibility is it's there, but we have a high jitter on our output signal, which means that you have two individuals who are similar to each other, but the algorithm is spinning out similar, 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 different, similar, different, similar. But on average, you know, maybe it's, it's uh, a good indicator, but we have a high jitter on the signal. So we need to figure that out, and to do that, we apply the filter. And that filter was uh, that formula that I showed at the beginning. What we're doing is if we have a filter length of 50 seconds, right, we're looking at five second windows. We're taking 10 five second windows, taking the output from DBAD from each of those five second windows, averaging that together and saying, where's the mean? How good are we with that mean? Use that mean to try and figure out if they are uh, separate or if they're together. And what you can see is all of a sudden, uh, the, more, the, the longer we observe the output from the algorithm, the better we're getting. So we have 90% after, uh, after 120 seconds. So 90% recognition after 120 seconds of observing five second iterations of uh, social proximity output from, from EBAD. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that the section assumption was true, that the reason why we have a bad output initially from the algorithm, the reason why we have a bad recognition rate is because we have a jitter on the signal, which is what, changing between affiliated and non-affiliated. It's going back and forth, but the majority of the, of the time, it's giving us the correct answer. So we just need to smooth the output and we can get um, How good results. How does DBAD work? You just choose two other people and compare. Some. Everyone, so, so um, everyone, everyone in the crowd, right? Um, after five seconds, you take, you take the five seconds of data that you see from your orientation center, mm -hmm. sensor. You build uh, a fun Mises mixture model, which is pretty much it's a, let me see if I can do that. Do we have a, here we go. So we're gonna have, we're going to have, uh, so it's a circular distribution, right? And let's say we'll have the guy was walking north for most of the time, and then he walked south for a little bit of time. And so the distribution is going to kind of look like this. It's going to go around the circle, and then we're going to have another bump here. And it's going to go back, right? So it's going to look like, it's going to look like a Gaussian mixture model just spread out around a circle. So it's, it's circular. And uh, you send that to every single neighbor that you have, and you receive a response from every single neighbor that you have about what their model is like. And as soon as you get their model, you overlap it on your model uh, and get the divergence. How different is their model from my model? That indicates for me, right now, the social proximity at this instant to me and each of my neighbors. Then I take that social proximity and I monitor that, the change in that, over several different iterations, average those together, and then use a threshold to say, if it's above this threshold, then I'm going to assume we're affiliated. If it's below this threshold, we're not affiliated with each other. What's this difference then? The centralized algorithm is I take I take um, I take uh, I take uh, I take the uh, the sensor signal over time, right? This will be something like this. Uh, here, this will be uh, zero, and this will be two pi. And and I take I take uh, the, sen the the signal from one person, and I take the signal from the neighbor person. Now this is now these are discrete signals where I have a whole bunch of points, right? So over five over five seconds, if you're sampling with 30 hertz, you're gonna have a whole lot of dots. And, uh, and I get the second one from somebody else that's going to look like this. And I, 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 I use the uh, cross correlation on both of these signals, right, which will shift them back and forth until I find the point where I have the optimal correlation between these two signals. That then gives me an indicator of how similar they are. And I have this for every single person because it's centralized. Right? So I have, I have, I have that, that red matrix from every individual to every other individual. And then I throw that into a clustering algorithm, which then tells me there's a block up here and there's a block down here. Yeah, and that's what we're looking at right now. It could do the same analysis. So this is this this curve right here is this one. This curve right here is this one. And what you see is after if we if uh, after about you know 160 seconds, we have values that are only uh, you know 0.01 percent off or 0.01 pp difference. Yeah. So the, uh, if I understand correctly. Uh, 
those uh, circular distributions are essentially histograms of the, uh, everything in the world. Well, it's a PDF. So it could be approximated as a histogram where you're just chopping up into blocks. So the, the way you're constructing it is as a his, uh, by using a histogram um, of no. everything in the world. Okay. No, 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 no. So you take all of the data and you and you do model fitting. So it's expectation maximization. Okay, sure. So, right, so you try it off with two clusters, try it off with three. Calculate so you're your error. Uh, but it, that that kind of describes uh, the distribution of directions over the window that you're. you're right. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a PDF. So the dis exactly. It's the, it's, the, it's the probability density function. So it's so the distribution. Is it necessarily jitter or? Uh, I mean, the the people in the experiment were walking around essentially randomly. So if you have more or less a random distribution of directions. Uh, I can see this is this is what this so what happens is right if I if I if I'm looking at if I so the diameter was six meters across, right? People mm -hmm. usually walk with I don't know two to three meters per second, right? Okay. So if we have um if we have uh if we have somebody who's first they they walk to the first post and they walk to this direction. They get to that post and then they walk to this post and they walk in this direction. So what happens is if we model that as a, if exactly this behavior, right, like here, will give us this. So we have this little peak is, is this trajectory, and then this big peak here is this trajectory. And it's never straight, they're always wobbling a little bit because they're walking, which is why you have Gaussian distributed noise on each of these means. Sure. And, uh, and what happens is if I observe that too long, then they start walking in this direction, then they start walking in that direction, they start walking in that direction. And then my distribution just looks like this. Exactly, then you get this. Then you just get this, which, which, is why, which is why this is disappearing off the noise, after a certain amount of time, because you're right. getting a flat distribution all the way around your uh, your Fermi's model, right? And that that doesn't let you differentiate between anybody. Yep. So it's only you know if, if I had if I had different types of behavior where um, if I had, if I had some different activity, then this then this five seconds might you know if the circle was twice as large, then this peak at five seconds would be at ten seconds. Okay, so essentially what you're doing is uh, kind of replicating the uh, the bottom graph by just taking more samples of uh, yeah more. okay but here's the thing so what would I have to in order to do this in a distributed fashion I have to communicate this entire timeline the five seconds of data at each iteration to each of my neighbors right, right. so, so we have so the communication is a function of how much data we have here for this one I have to create uh, I have to send one uh, one mean point and uh, it would be a variance, except for uh, it's, uh, it's a vessel function for, for, for that. But more, more or less, it's a, it's a mu and a sigma for each of these, and that's it. Exactly. So I'm, I'm, you know, this is, so this, is, this, is, this is eight bytes, and this is you know, kilobytes after a while. So you're sketching the, the timeline? I'm sketching the timeline and ignoring the time, the time parameter. OK. More or less. Sketching the timeline, and I'm ignoring the time parameter. And you were saying histograms. So there's actually two curves here. I deleted one of them because it was kind of confusing from the from the label. But so the blue line um, is actually the blue line is actually using a histogram because I want to figure out what is the error that comes from using from modeling a histogram as a distribution, right? So if I'm using the histogram, I'm using the exact value. I'm using the data, but I have to transmit each and every bucket in the histogram. And the other one is model that as a, as, a, as a distribution, which is going to have some error compared to looking at the histogram, and see how much that affects it. It almost affects it nothing. Sure. So, and especially uh, once you get in the filter, it's exactly the same value all the way up. So yeah. when you run it, do you specify that you're looking for two clusters here, nope. or two mixed components? Nope. You just you just throw it at it. The thing is, because we're looking at it from a from a distributed point of view, we're not so much interested in the number of clusters anymore. I mean, it's fairly accurate. What happens? But we're not interested in the number of clusters. We're interested in each person in the crowd needs to know the neighbors that I see, how many of them are my friends, and how many of them are people I don't know. Because those are the people I'm going to stick with, and those are the people I should be um, I should be propagating management messages in the crowd emergency to. Right. So the goal is slightly different from a peer-to-peer -peer standpoint than from a centralized standpoint. But when you're doing the estimation for the mixture distribution, you need to tell it how many components. No. So these. Uh -uh. So um, this is. These distributions are done using expectation maximization. And so the trick for expectation maximization is you start off with one cluster, maximize it, figure out what's your error. Start off with two clusters, maximize it, figure out what's your error. And so what you're going to have is you have a graph like this, and you're going to start off with one cluster, and you're going to have really high error up here. You know, second cluster, and you're going to have error down here. And you're going to get a curve that looks like this over the number of clusters. And pretty much right here, that's the point that tells you, OK, I have more or less three clusters. But this is really computationally intensive. So the trick is you take uh, you take the data and first you throw it into, into an algorithm that'll give you the number of clusters without costing too much. So subtractive clustering is a good one for that. 
Then you take that and you throw it into a k-means cluster, which pushes the clusters more or less. So you're going to have, the, which will push the clusters more or less onto the onto the onto the peaks where you have them. And only then do you start off uh, expectation maximization, which has a lot of iterations and costs a lot of computational power to optimize this model. But then, uh, over the, uh, as it moves along, does that number stay the same? You make it? No, it depends. It depends because this is that the fact that there are two clusters here is not because we have two groups. We have two clusters here because the person only walked in two directions in those five seconds. Right. So we can only have two groups and have 17 clusters on the, on, in, in the individual models. But when you do the accuracy, the ground truth you have is two clusters. You know, these people are already. No, the ground truth is just affiliated or disaffiliated. So this, this has nothing to do with the number of groups. This is only the behavior of the individual. So um, to do the ground truth, we know, OK, we have 10 individuals. And in this experiment, there were two groups. Uh, and so these five were affiliated with each other, and then these five, and then they're not affiliated with the other five, but those other five are affiliated with each other. And that gives us uh, a list of, uh, of affiliations and non-affiliations, and we just look at what is, accuracy is what percent of those individual to individual links were judged correct for the affiliation and non-affiliation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions about, about this? All right. Okay. So maybe I can skip over this, but this is just intu intuitively uh, why why the performance looks the way it does. So this is this is an example of uh, a good snapshot, right? Where we have two different groups. One of them is going that direction. One of them is going that direction. You can kind of look at it. And you can see, okay, so this looks like it's one group. That looks like it's another group based on the data and the F score, which tells you uh, in more or less how well we performed. Uh, we we have a decent value. Right? That's one snapshot. There's a couple. There's a little bit of error over here, where one guy here and one guy here are kind of going in the same direction. Right? But that's one snapshot. Now this is what happens if we have two different groups. They're both in different locations, but they're both heading in the same direction. And what you see is this is garbage. Right? We have no way of figuring out if uh, if because we don't have location, absolute location, as as an input. This looks like garbage. Now one thing I didn't uh, I didn't talk about is that because we're using peer-to-peer -peer location. We have a limited distance, right? Not everyone can communicate with everybody else. You can only communicate with those people that are inside of your reach of your Bluetooth communication chip. And so what happens is a lot of these errors get filtered out because we're implicitly using location, which means that a bunch of these guys, their devices won't even be able to communicate with those guys. So we don't have, uh, so we don't have their data, which means that we have uh, uh, an improvement in precision because we're not calculating. Uh, it's saying that these people belong together because we don't even see them. So it's kind of uh, implicit use of, of location helps the algorithm. And this is what happens when we apply the filter over the whole experiment. You can see that even though we have errors here, and this is really poor in terms of, uh, in terms of indication of what's going on, uh, when you look at everything averaged together, you get a fairly good, uh, a fairly good uh, estimation of what's going on. We even have a precision of one, which means um, which means we're really good at judging. If two people are together, we're really good at figuring that out. We're not so great at figuring out if two people are separate if they're, if they're still together. So that's, that's where the weak point is. And so in summary for, for this research, most important thing, sensor must be indicative of social proximity. For whatever type of group it is, it might be uh, an online, an online chat, uh, chat forum that defines this group. It means interaction is going to be typing back and forth to each other. So the sensor that we need might be uh, a sensor that tells us when users are online or not. That might be what's indicative for this type of group. Um, uh, DVAD, uh, DVAD is effective when, uh, if we filter over time to improve the precision and limiting the P2P distance to improve recall. Actually, sorry, that's the other way around. So uh, uh, P2P distance improves precision and filtering improves uh, recall. And another really interesting thing is even though the experiment that we did was fairly small and we haven't evaluated it, scaled up to really large groups, the computational complexity for each classification is dependent on the number of neighbors and not on the size of the group. And what that means is we are only dependent on crowd density. So how many people are inside of that reach that I have in my peer-to-peer -peer communication and not on the total size of the crowd. Which means that no matter how big the crowd is, it's only about how many people I can see. They define how much work it's going to be. And the really cool thing about, about this algorithm is because we're, using, um, um, because we're using distributions to model the data, we can easily incorporate uh, new feature dimensions, and that means new sensor modalities, into the same computation. It becomes a little bit more complex because uh, 
calculating the divergence between multi-dimensional models, you start for, so if you're talking about two features, you're now starting, uh, you, have to, you have to cut uh, planes through these models and three features, then you get into hyperplanes. So it's a bit complex, but in theory, you can do it. And that is a big advantage over, uh, over correlation approaches where you have to cluster each one separately and then do graph analysis to bring those clusters together. Okay, that's it for, for that part. Are there any questions on that? Yes. So one of the, uh, I guess, requirement you mentioned is that for each uh, user in his P P2P kind of setup has to send his, you know, thing to, to the neighbors, right? And then you in turn to receive that. Um, how do you address sort of the incentive issue? I mean, why would I well, do that? I mean, considering the energy, privacy, and all that. Yeah. yeah. Well, the incentive, so for emergency situations, the incentive is clear. You don't want to die. So I think most people, most people, the idea with that, this would be some emergency module that's on everyone's phone. Okay. That, because one, you, once you get an emergency situation, whether or not you have to charge your phone when you get home doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's all about just, you know, making, uh, making it out, making it out. So that's, you know, for this, for this specific scenario, um, it's not a big deal. Now, when you look at other applications, like for example, social media, like if you want to post something on Facebook, then you want uh, people automatically tagged that are already traveling with you or something like that. Then the good thing about this is that the communication is reduced, and after the screen display, wireless communication is the most expensive part. Computation costs almost nothing on the phone now, it's wireless communication on the screen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because we're reducing uh, communication, there's an analysis on power consumption in the paper. It's, you know, it's like, uh, I think it was like an 85% reduction in power consumption of this based on a centralized approach, which is interesting because a centralized approach, you're offloading all the data and you don't have to do any processing. Mm -hmm. But the processing costs you nothing on the phone anyways because you have a quad core 1.7 gigahertz or whatever in there, but the communication is what really gets it. Are you going to talk sort of in more detail as to how the particular application of, you know, this group activity recognition can help you in emergency situation? I, I, I remember you see this meet, yeah, yeah, yeah. meet tail, whatever example, but yeah. exactly how, how does that help? Like if I have capability of detecting it, these well, kinds yeah. of rules, what? Okay, so it, it helps in as far as it provides somebody who is in charge awareness of what's going on in the crowd. Now, uh, the management, so technologically, so what, we, so what we need, so what we need is, we need, uh, um, so we have, we, have, we have the crowd down here, and we have some kind of, uh, we have some kind of uh, management thing up here, and what, what they need is they need behavioral inputs to understand what's going on, and they need some sort of management system that can then disseminate um, messages throughout, throughout the crowd. And so what this has just solved is um, part, of, part of this, and then also how, how can we, if we have very, very little bandwidth, right, because almost everything is dead, how can we, through peer-to-peer -peer methods, disseminate messages throughout the crowd? And that is along these lines of group affiliation. Now, the difficult part is how to do this, right? So how, how do we understand, based on this input, what is the output? And this is a huge open question, and this is something that we don't understand. Because as I'm about to talk about, the behavior of this crowd is emergent behavior, which means that it's dependent on every individual within the crowd and, uh, and, but also it is, it is not, the parameters of the crowd behavior are completely different than the parameters of the behavior of every individual within the crowd. And we still have no way of knowing if I'm gonna exact a change up here. If I tell everyone to, to walk left instead of right, how is that gonna affect the emergent behavior of the crowd? So this is a huge open question. Um, I was involved in several different proposals to research exactly this. I know the research is going on, but that's not something we know how to do yet. So I'm solving, so here I've solved, I've solved part of this, and now I'm about to talk about another part of this, and a little bit of this down here. Um, this is a technical challenge, it's not that big of a deal. This is where this is where the research has to continue. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, it fits me. Let me ask you another question. If, if all you wanted to do is to be able to detect who are, you know, likely to be with who, in, as in a group, right? So these guys tend to hang out together, mm -hmm. right? And so, so you can probably decide some kind of guidance for their decision later on to direct this group or one person. If, if that's all you wanted to do, would um, the past history or past behavior of each individual or as a group be useful? I mean, are you yes. looking at the, the most, price, 
the most useful thing. That would be the most useful thing. And if you don't have the restrictions of having a, of having a process that in a peer-to-peer -peer method, the best way is take every observation you have over every single individual, put that in a server, use some kind of distance metric which tells you how similar or, or, or different they are from each other, and then use that, throw that in a standard clustering algorithm, do graph cutting, and then figure out, okay, these probably belong together and these probably belong together. That's, that would be the straight, most straightforward way to do it if you don't have any of these restrictions. But you could also have this, you know, the information stored on the phone, and then just you know, instead of looking at this real time, you know, yeah. right now, the, what what's the signal and detect who could be with who, you can use the history data that's already stored on the phone, right, to help you, right. And the only thing we're doing here is, yeah. and you're hundred percent right. Now, the only thing we're doing here that is different is instead of having these phones exchange histories, mm -hmm. history data with each other, we're saying model the data on the phone and exchange parameter models instead of exchanging the history of data. Oh, sure, sure. So the That's problem is still, in real time, the problem is still exactly the same thing. How do I figure out how distant I am from somebody else according to our data uh, without telling them what my data looks like? Right. The idea is only build a model and exchange the parameters instead. But the history would be the most important thing. Because the longer you saw the curve, the longer I observe somebody, the better I am at figuring out who they belong together with and who they don't. Hmm. So my, if, I have, if I have 10 years of history, it's going to be fairly easy. So there was some more related question, right? Uh, can you pose it such that you would be looking at priors? So for instance, you know, there was a lot of work done on crowd behavior modeling for emergency situations, right? When they build a new hall or, or things like that, they would basically there are those asymmetric models. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if that kind of information could be fed as a prior information to the model or incorporate it to, for instance, improve the... It could, yeah, it could. And that would be that would be a, a, a different kind of insight that might help with management. So, you know, okay, this pathway is designed for a constant crowd flow through, and now we're seeing uh, turbulence and crowd quakes in this pathway, which is something that's not supposed to be occurring there. Actually, this stuff's not supposed to be occurring anywhere. But if you see that, then that would be something that you would want. You could use that as a prior to describe um, how potentially dangerous this 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 information that we're saying from the crowd right now is given that the space was designed to be used in a certain way. But that's kind of getting up more into the management area. That would be uh, something that would be more important for, for management. That would be, for, in, my, in my opinion, that would be management techniques. Okay. So, all right. I only have 11 minutes left. So. <laughs> the part two. Yeah, part two. <laughs> so again, we're gonna have to try out, right? Except this time, we're trying to figure out what, once we have a group, we're trying to figure out what that group is doing. And again, we're looking at exchanging model parameters from observations based on individuals' devices. But now, instead of trying to figure out are two individuals similar or different, we're trying to figure out based on our model, is what they're doing type behavior A or behavior type B? So it's a different, it's a different question given on the same settings. And it's challenging because, as I was saying before, Behavior of a group is emergent, which means it is qualitatively different. Its parameters are different than the behavior of each individual within that group or any sort of logical or semantic sum of that behavior. Yeah? It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. So if you look at if you look at these circles here, you see a bunch of circles, but your eye builds this three-dimensional cube. Um, and that's emergent, right? That cube is not in there anywhere, but the sum of them all together is different than the parameters of each individual one. If I only look at one circle, it's impossible to say, based on that circle, I think that a cube is going to come out, right? There's no way to see the cube based on that one circle. That's exactly the same uh, phenomena that we have by group activity recognition. So here we have a group of individuals. I hope everyone can see. Um, and when you look at this image, you see, okay, they're outside. You get all this context information with it. You see they're outside. Two teams, yellow and, and, uh, and red, and that they're playing Frisbee. You see the Frisbee. But you can also figure out they're playing something like Frisbee based on looking at the behavior of everyone in there. When you only see one person, you see kind of a fuzzy image um, of somebody who might be playing sports, might just be hanging out outside. They might be playing volleyball, they might be playing frisbee, they might be being really lazy by some completely different sport. So it's impossible for you to figure out what is going on in the, in the whole picture based on the observation of one individual. So how can we get this global view using distributed observations of a single individual? And, and the approach that I'm going to present is called uh, uh, distributed probabilistic inference with loopy belief propagation. And, uh, and the approach is fairly simple, actually. It is infer what you think is going on and tell your neighbors about it. Get the response from your neighbors, incorporate that into your belief, 
And you do that again and again and again until everyone decides on one thing together. So there's a belief step where everyone uses an evidence function to infer what they think is the most likely role behavior for them within which group activity. So am I, am I sitting up here, standing up here and talking at a presentation? Or am I at a cocktail party? Right? Or am I sitting down uh, uh, drinking coffee upstairs? Right? These are different role behaviors that I would exhibit in different types of group activities, and I want to figure out which one is the most likely. And then I have the propagation step, where I tell everyone else what I believe is going on based on uh, what I see. And so I would tell all of your guys' phones, and I would say, look, I don't think we're having, uh, we're upstairs drinking coffee because I'm standing instead of sitting, but we could either be at a cocktail party because I'm talking the whole time, or I also do it at a cocktail party. Um, or uh, I'm at a presentation where everyone else is sitting down listening. And, um, and so you guys say, hmm, well, I'm sitting down, and he's standing up, so I'm, it's probably a presentation, right? And so we keep repeating this until all of us have come to find the best combination of what your behaviors and my behaviors all fit together uh, to find out which, uh, which group activity we, we, are, we are now taking part in. And this is what it looks mathematically. Um, we, have, uh, we have this uh, distributed probabilistic inference with movie belief propagation function down here. The way it breaks down is we have observations made by each individual device of individuals' behavior. Um, and then we have an evidence function. This evidence function tells us what is the probability that I'm sitting down given that my phone signal looks the way it does right now, and what's the probability that I'm standing up given that my phone signal looks the way it does right now. And then we have a potential function between my phone and your phone that tells my phone what it believes about your phone given what it's seen of its own behavior. And so this is, uh, this is the local evidence function right here. Uh, this is uh, uh, a Gaussian mixture model. So uh, did I draw it? No, I had it in the last slide. Um, uh, and then what we have here is a potential function. And we explore two different ways of how we can go about uh, modeling interpersonal um, uh, group dynamics uh, based on based on the evidence, and what we found was a, a linear multivariate regression and expectation. So, what do I believe about you based on the probability of all of my different activities that I could be doing, or what do I believe about you given my most likely activity? That's expectation. And once once this is all stabilized, once we've stabilized this whole network, so I know that I'm probably standing at and giving a talk, and you guys know that you're probably sitting and listening to my talk. Then what we can do is, all of us together can each go through this classification stage. We'll say, well, then the most likely group behavior is going to be talk, right? And so each of us does that um, distributedly. But if the network has uh, diverged to a certain decision, then we're all going to come to the same conclusion. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the, the method with uh, multivariate regression. Um, there's, there's a paper, and it's also in the, in the dissertation, where you can take a look and see how these two both of them have advantages and disadvantages for different situations. Um, but we're going to be focusing only on this one. And this is the experiment. We had, uh, again, monitoring people with wearable devices, accelerometer, gyroscope, orientation sensor, GPS only used to simulate peer-to-peer -peer communication, not used as a sensor for recognition. 10 subjects, 16 sports, 10 hours of data. And this is, uh, this is, what, uh, this is what a centralized system looks like here at the top. So somebody that has the emergent image, the entire behavioral data set in front of them, how well can they infer group behavior? And again, you see, we start off at a very high value. The longer we observe it, the longer our window is, that period of observation, uh, the better we get. What we see down here at the bottom is how well each node can infer the group behavior given only local observation. So this is the mean, and this is the uh, standard deviation for, uh, for, for these nodes that are that are computing this, and what you can see is we're far worse, but we also have an increase over time, and I can talk about why that's the case if you'd like. Um, at the end, kind of running short on time here, and um, and what we have is we have this metric which just tells us how difficult is how big is this gap. This gap tells us how emergent the problem is. Emergence taken from social psychology just says it's emergent if the properties of the group behavior are different than the properties of the local individual behavior. So this tells us. That is, uh, this tells us how well it's emerging, and you can see down here it goes down over time. So we're going to look at a window length of two seconds because this gives us a good degree of emergence, which means it's a challenging problem. So we can see how well these algorithms are performing. So this is this is the first curve of um, again we start off here with how well each node could predict the group behavior by itself, and this is how well we did with a central system uh, using a simple naive Bayes inference approach. And what you can see is, looking at the shape of the curve, it does converge. So the first thing we can tell is that this network does converge to some kind of conclusion. 
And what we can also see is that after 14 iterations, we have a conclusion that performed better than a centralized system. Now, this doesn't mean that distributed is better than centralized. It just means that the distributed model where we take uh, interpersonal uh, group dynamics into account is better for recognizing uh, group behavior than a centralized model that just does inference on in all the data as, with, as if it was one feature vector. And, um, and obviously, all of this can be computed centrally. So anything you can do distributed, you can also do centrally. And uh, what we also see is that, uh, is that after a few iterations, one, two, three iterations, we've already surpassed the centralized system. So that's, you know, this is, this is pretty cool because it shows us that we don't have to iterate too much um, to, to get to the uh, correct result. But this is done if everyone can communicate with everybody else in the network. So what happens when we can only communicate with some of our neighbors? And what you see here is up at the top, we have uh, the, the mean of the last graph we saw. And then right down underneath it is reducing to 20 meters. Then we reduce to 15 meters. That's here, 10 meters, and 5 meters. So 20 meters and 15 meters doesn't really do much to how, uh, to how accurate we are. You know, we lose a tiny little bit. But once we hit 10 meters, then we have, you know, we have a significant loss in, in recognition capabilities. So this point right here means that 5% uh, you know, of the time, we're, or 10% of the time, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're guessing wrong at what the group behavior is. So 7% you know, of the nodes every time are guessing wrong what's going on. And then once we get down here, we have, uh, we're still converging, but we're converging to a pretty crappy result. So we have a very bad idea what's going on. And so the question is, well, why does this happen? And uh, what will give us a good insight into that is if we look at the convergence percent after five iterations. So how much, how much of this value out here have we already reached after only five iterations? And up at the top here, we have, 90, we have 91%, which drops down to 89% and then 88%. And then once we hit 10, we're going down to 86%. So you see, you know, we're converging slower as the, as the reach goes down. But then, when we can only communicate five meters, and we can only communicate to very few people, all of a sudden it shoots back up. So what does that mean? Well, the first thing it shows us is that the reason why this is happening is because we have disjoint subgroups, which means our network, due to the low communication distance, is breaking up into two networks, and information is not being exchanged between them. So we're con converging really fast because, uh, because we have very few people that we have to communicate with. But the value we're converging to is not observing all of the behavior of the members of the group. So we're converging to a fairly poor value. So this joint subgroups reduces how well we can recognize what's going on. And the speed of convergence, how fast, how fast we, uh, we converge, depends on how many people I can reach in a single hop communication. So if I can reach everybody, we're going to converge really fast because my information is spread out throughout the entire room inside of one iteration. But if I have to communicate to the people in the first row and then communicate that farther back on, then that's going to slow us down. So uh, it produces coverage. Um, OK, so here, in summary for this part, peer-to-peer uh, -peer group activity recognition is really interesting uh, because of the emergent nature of group behavior and the complexity of the activity and the, the disparity between emergent nature of group behavior and the singular view of a mobile device. Uh, DPI LVP converges, but the speed depends on the coverage and the accuracy depends on the connectivity. And one of the really cool implications is that um, for all of these quantified self applications where people are looking to document their own behavior for themselves and look at it and see what it means, if you're only documenting yourself, you're missing half the picture. So there's all of this behavior that you're, that's going on that's important to you because you're a social, a social animal inside of a group with other people that you can't document if you're only observing your own behavior. So I think um, we had a lot of questions during the talk, and I think I'm going to leave off with that because that's that's the full hour. That's about all I have. Um, I have a really cool startup, which I'm not going to get to tell you guys about. But um, the papers are all online. It's all on my website. Uh, um, you can also download anything you want, and uh, um, feel free. Let me see. I think I have a slide here with my email on it, so I'm going to put that up because I think uh, if you guys want to talk to me, I'd really love to hear what you have to think about it. And uh, and um, please get in touch. All right, so this is just the info, info email. But that, that lands in my inbox. So write me an email if you'd like. And I thank you very much for your attention. And anyone that wants to stick around and ask some more questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, anyone that has to leave, I completely understand. Thank you for your attention. And it was uh, my pleasure to present today. Oh, I got Did, didn't you say
you have four parts and you only covered two? Well, the first part was just a basic introduction to activity recognition. Okay, and then, then the two algorithms, and the, 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 the fourth part was now about. Um, okay, so the only part is that. So, which I already knew. Which you already knew. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you. I have. Okay, thank you very, very much. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Yes. You look at any sort of system or interface protocol like a gossip protocol to do activity recognition. A gossip protocol. So are you talking about so a gossip would mean so I mean it is it is gossiping. More or less it is gossiping. I'm communicating with whoever's around kind of. What's not happening is that using gossip to support multi hop communication. Right. So because it's just single hop iteration. Integrating that through in a probabilistic way to internal beliefs and then it propagates instead of through multi hop communication, it propagates through multi hop elite propagation. So, for example, uh, you're standing there in the corner of the room and you're standing, uh, you're talking about five meters, uh, well, yeah, they have a good sense of distance, but let's say you cover about half the room uh, with your, your wireless. Thing. Um, if Someone more central in the room might be able to get a better sense of, hey, I'm, I'm at a top. There's one person standing up, everyone else is sitting down. Uh, and that kind of very strongly held belief that I am yeah. sitting could be essentially transmitted uh, to everyone in the room. Uh, that I'm, I'm participating in a group talk, uh, 